Plus, what are the top three books that have changed your life or inspired you? I think I, I used to do all the Tony Robbins stuff. I think that he has pretty good stuff. Like 85% of it is wonderful. There's very little not good stuff in it. Um, so like Awaken the Giant Within is quite good. I've read every marketing and sales book there is. So like, you know, when I was a kid and started my first business, I was reading guerrilla marketing and, you know, it, then I was reading how to copyright with like Jay Abrams and uh, other other guys that, that do like social circle kind of um, direct mail kind of copywriting stuff. I think that's super powerful. You know, people ask me about game theory and I'm like, you can skip learning about game theory and like Nash equilibrium and the, the prisoner the dilemma and all that. You can skip all that. That's useless. Just learn how to write good copy for mark to for sales, right? Cause that's, that's what matters. Being able to, to sell and, and frame awesome. and you know, that matters the, all this other crap, like people that study game theory, they're never good at it. It's weird. You know, it's like people that study weightlifting aren't as strong as people that just game lift theory, weights. Yeah. Game theory isn't really sales or marketing. Okay. It's not. I mean, it's lightly. They're lightly related, but it's too esoteric. You need you need the now, usable stuff. Any books in particular that people can check out? Um, I mean, Cialdini for Influence is great. So he wrote a book called Influence. Influence um, yeah. Cialdini. I think it's Robert Cialdini. Yes, um, yeah. And then, yeah, so Awaken the Giant Within, Robert Cialdini, Influence of, you know, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Um, I would say those would be three oh, wow. fabulous books to read. All right, two classics. Yeah, yeah, and read all the classics. Like you can, like. But here's the thing: like I read my book. I wrote a couple books, um, you and did? they're free. Yeah, just go to right. t.me forward slash survive, like survive through science. And there's two books there. Um, one is stuff that you can do personally to make your life amazing, and has better data than I've ever like it. it a conversation you'll have with me is far less efficient and effective than the book that we're met. Like there's more of me in my book than there is in person. Cause I forget all of what I know in person, but in my book, I remember it's been years that I've worked on it, you know? So it's got all of my good ideas in there. Um, yeah. Right. Like the so, next question we have, who are three people in history, whether famous people or just people not famous that have changed your life? Uh, hmm. I mean, I'm gonna. This is a lame one, I guess. But my father, like, had me working from diapers, right? Like, we're yeah. delivering newspapers, and I'm in the car in diapers, flipping the p the paper out of the car, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> not not the best spot for the paper to go for the person receiving it, but I'm, I'm working, yeah. right? And then you know, just work with people in teams and groups and very diverse, uh, you know, people down in South Florida. And uh, you know, I believe that gave me a lot of skills to one, be honest, and to work with people, and to, you know, be friendly and be social and get the job done, and and you know, be perseverant. So I think I think he installed a lot of really good, through example, uh, principles into me. You know, and he really worked to get me into a good school, and I ended up at a school that was like the smartest imaginable. Like I, the middle school I went to was the smartest school I ever went to. We learned logic before math. We learned scheme programming. You know, it was designed by an MIT professor that, uh, that invented new math. And this was where he was going to do it and change everything, change education from right there. So logic before math. Yeah, because you can derive math from logic, but you can't derive logic from math. It's like, it's so neat. So we learned like set theory and modulos and modus ponens and modus tollens and syllogistic inference and all these other really useful tools early on. And then that just kind of gave me this logical framework, which kind of amplified my performance everywhere else. Right. And it, it just, it was amazing. So if you want to look up the curriculum for giggles, if you, if you do a Google search for M E G S S S math education for gifted secondary school students, and you type curriculum, and you look at what the curriculum is for a sixth grade student, you won't understand any of the words. <laughs> you're just like, you're like, this was sixth grade. And then my education just got stupider ever, ever after, right? Like high school was dumber than middle school and college was dumber than high school. And I'm just like, why am I participating in this? Like I, well, this is, I've already learned all this stuff. Right. So then I guess I got out, right? Like I, I skipped my senior year of high school and just went right to college for free and early admissions. And then I did videotape college instead of attending, and I'm just like, man, this is garbage, right? So then I just videotape college. 
that was a thing well i just yeah man like if you're gonna well, if they're not learning anything anyway knowledge. yeah if you're, if you're not learning anything anyway and you already know all the stuff then why pretend you're learning in class right like it's just consuming my time and wait, it was something wait. i had to pay for like after wait. so is that a metaphor or do you mean like you just didn't go to college well, no, I went, I skipped my senior year of high school and the state paid for me to go to early admissions. And so I okay. went to college for free the first year. And then after I like got my degree, like got my high school diploma and was still in college, I figured, okay, well, I guess I'll get a degree or whatever. And then I had to pay for it. And then I was paying to go to college and it just sucked. The college sucked and I wasn't learning anything. So I'm like, okay, well then I guess I'll do the videotape to get the degree because it's just as dumb. Like I'm not, like I'm not, I already know this stuff anyway. What year was this? Oh, man. I mean, I graduated in 98, so this would have been 90, okay. 90 this, I would have started the, the phase of crappy college right after 1998. And then I think I did like uh, one, like a couple semesters and maybe six months. That I don't remember sense. how long a semester is. Yes. I did like six months and I quit. I'm like, why am I spending money to, to not learn anything useful when I could just work a job and make money and the money goes this way instead of that way? Like it was a no brainer. Yeah, okay, that's very interesting. So the education system teaches you things you can't make money on. And as long as the education system is teaching it to you, you will never make money on it because value is derived by supply and demand. And if everyone is learning the same thing, then it has the absolute maximum supply. And so you must learn what they're not teaching in school if you want to make outsized returns. So you, you have to learn what they're not teaching in school if you want to make a lot of money, period. And so going to school is actually not a good way to make money. Like even if you're a lawyer, when you go to school to become a lawyer, when you get to the law office, nothing that they have you do looks like anything you were taught in school. You're cold calling people and, and filling out wills. And none of that was in school. And you're like, okay, well, why didn't I just skip the school, right? And so even if you're going to be a lawyer, you can, you can just take the bar and become a lawyer in certain states. And then that license will be uh, passported across state lines to other states. And so like you can go to Louisiana and just take the bar exam without going to school and be a lawyer and just get to work and start doing lawyer things without wasting your time in school. I if mean, you're a self-starter, you know. Do, I definitely do agree with you that school, like for me, I mean, I'm very academic. Both my parents are professors. I have bachelor's and master's in computer engineering, but I've never used that in anything I've done outside of college. It just doesn't work. There's no application but, for it. Like, but, but I wouldn't say everybody should not go to school because not everybody is. You're just going to a different school. Why? You're going, well, you're going to a different school. So I'm not saying don't learn. I'm saying learn. So there's two types of learning you can do. You can do push learning, which is I'm going to learn all this crap, and then I hope some of it becomes useful, right? I'm going to learn the, the order of the planets from the sun and how many there are, even though I don't have a spaceship and I don't got to turn left at Mars or anything. I'm going to learn it anyway. I'm going to hope it becomes useful one day. And then literally people just forget everything they were taught. If I, if, I, if I quizzed you on how many planets there were and what the order from the sun was, there's like a 20% chance you'd know. Do you want to try it? Uh, no. <laughs> but you know you were taught it, right? You, knew, you used yeah. to know it, but now you don't know it. So how much well, value was there in that? There was no value because there's no value in stuff that you can pull up through Google. Pretty much. Pretty much. The value is in applying stuff. Exactly. So applying what can we do instead of push? We can pull. So here's a goal and a target that I want to achieve. And I need to learn a lot of things to get there, right? And so how do I, how do I get to this point? Okay, I got to learn this. I got to learn that. I got to learn this. And then you have a critical path that you're still learning the right things to get something done instead of learning 50 of the wrong things. You're still learning, but you're learning in the most efficient way possible using that pull system, right? There's something pulling you to learn things. Instead of you learning a bunch of stupid crap and forgetting most of it and none of it being ever applicable. So in, in book two, in those two books of SciVive, uh, the one called Fix the World, that one goes into how we can fix politics and the education system and things that are outside of any individual's control usually. Um, the first book focuses on things that are inside your control. Wow, well I've done said. videos on these things too. All my early YouTube videos were about these topics because I didn't talk about crypto back then. Okay. So all my early YouTube videos are self-help uh, self uh, videos. Now, I mean, going back to what you said about college, I mean, the way I view it is, I agree with everything you said. I kind of have a different perspective. My perspective is kind of more derived from, from Nietzsche and just from philosophy. Not everybody can be great by, by definition. Sure. Yeah. So, it's a tautology. So for those who cannot be great, 
having a cookie cutter path to having some form of I agree. I would just use a different or, cookie cutter. I, th I think the cookie cutters we have right now suck. I think we should teach ethics. I think we, we should teach fashion. I think we should teach how to not get ripped off. I think we should teach how to be a good friend. And that shit's not in the curriculum. But what is in the curriculum is like understanding the difference between an igneous rock and a volcanic rock. Or actually, igneous and volcanic might be the same. I can't remember to tell the truth. <laughs> um, that shit is useless. So we need to replace learning about rocks with learning about being a good human right? Like emotional management. When do they teach, teach you, you good emotional emotion, management in, emotional in school? Intelligence. Yeah, they don't Never. even teach you that shit. Like, it's so stupid that we've had all of this high performance. You know, I studied to be a life coach, and I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on Tony Robbins stuff. And, you know, I've, I've got a, a NLP master practitioner cert. And, you know, I've done, you know, all the things. I've walked on burning coals a bunch of times. I've fasted for a week. I've, I've done all the stuff, right? Traveled the world and all that jazz. None of that is taught in school. <laughs> Why? It's, it's, it's the knowledge is there. We know it works, right? And why don't we just teach that stuff that we know works instead of all of this crap that we know does not work? It just drives I mean, me mad. I would say college is, college is a business. So my, my first week of college, I wanted to, to drop out. But yeah. I, I couldn't just because of my, my, my family. <laughs> right. But I'm still glad I, I finished but I know who I was. If I dropped out, I still would be successful. Right. But I can't say that for everybody else out there. So for those who are not as motivated or who are not self-starters, I don't want to just say, hey, drop out and go do whatever you want. Because not everybody can be great. Not everybody has that, yeah. that inner game that's that so you, You're right. I mean, I, but, I, imagine if we taught kids how to just paint houses or fix cars or fix air conditioners instead of earth space science. Seriously. Yeah. Like would I, I, it would make the world a better place. People say, "Oh, but you know, you know, what people might not do what they want to do. You can let them pick which thing they want to do." Like, you know. Now they do do that in parts of I think like Europe or Good. Like in Germany or Thank where God. They, have, they have like technical schools where you go there and you just learn a trade. Good. It's better because they can paint your fucking house, man. I, like, I build my own computers. I, I build my own microphones. I build my own keyboards. I, I like fix my own steel things. Like, I do all this stuff because I just learned it because there's things I wanted to do earlier in life, and now I have those skills forever, right? I do my own video production. I build my own cryptocurrencies because I just stayed engaged and kept learning, right? And I and I didn't waste my time learning the wrong shit. Like, if you ask me about sports. I don't know a goddamn thing currently. I used to know a lot. I used to play football, right? Mm -hmm. But now I don't know anything because I traded that. I sacrificed that. I sacrificed sports knowledge for excellence in business, right? Like I, you got to decide what you want to be good at, right? Do you, do you want to be good at, at what everyone else is good at and who's going to get drafted and all that shit? How much money is there in that? Nothing. I, the, I used to root for the if Dolphins, you're betting, right? there is money in that. It well, Gambling don't, don't, bet, don't bet, <laughs> don't bet, don't <laughs> bet. Like, so it, the Dolphins, they changed the name of the, the stadium. They changed the players. They changed the coach and they changed the mascot. They changed everything. So I'm like, what am I rooting for here? Like, there's nothing, <laughs> there's, there's, there's no similarity between what this was and what, like, and I have no influence over it because I used to get really mad, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, when things didn't work out in the field, you get super pissed. And it's just not, I decided that there's a better way to live. There's no reason for me to be getting super upset about this stuff that I have absolutely no control over, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So last question before we end up uh, wrapping up the show. Sure. So what are the three biggest actions you took in your life that have changed and transformed your life and made you who you are and made you successful? Started my own business, for sure. That's the um, car business? That was the car? This was the car stereo business was the first one, yeah. I mean, I tried earlier ones when I was young. Like, I used to sell candy, and, you know, I got mm -hmm. some people to try and sell, like, uh, greeting cards and stuff. You know, like, in the back of Boy's Life magazine, there was an advertisement for it. And then, mm -hmm. uh, what else? So, I think, I think, because that scales, right? And so, I got mm -hmm. a video called One Way to Buy Your Freedom, uh, or One Way to Get Rich. And it tells you, you got to make enough money. Here's one way to do it. Buy stuff on Alibaba. Stock it locally. Put out an advertisement for it. If people call, you're in business. If people don't call, you're not in business. As a matter of fact, you can put the phone number advertisement out first to see if people call before you even buy anything. 
And then if people start calling, you tell them, okay, well, you know, I was just doing a test run. Sorry, I don't really have it. Or you could be a dick and lie to them and say, oh, it's sold already, right? right. I prefer the more truthful thing. And then, you know, if your phone starts ringing and you know there's demand for a thing, well, then you could buy it, stock it, and now you're in business. And that, that, that idea will continue to work until everyone's local area is filled with high quality, low margin, you know, good priced products. And that's never the case. What's the case is that you go and most of the stuff you look at sucks and no one knows what's good and what's not. And the prices aren't that great. And so there's a huge niche that is available locally wherever you are to become an expert in whether it is purses or car stereo stuff or, you know, I like electronics because they're higher ticket prices. You know, you're in between like $300, $500 items. So you can make, you know, maybe 30, 40% margin on each one. If you sell lower ticket items, you just got to sell so many more of them. And the customer support is about the same, right? Gonna, it's going to eat as much time to do customer support for a cheap product as an expensive one. Mm -hmm. So that gives you the time to buy your freedom. And then once you're free and you've hired your first employee to replace yourself, now you've got free time. You make a little bit less money because you got an employee, but you got your free time. And then you learn the next thing. And the next thing you learn scales because that local crap, it doesn't scale. So you get into internet things. You get into digital things. You get into things that you can ship over state lines. And then you could get this opportunity to make money while you're sleeping. Now that, that business still will make money while you're sleeping and you can still ship things. And you know, there's still a lot of good parts to retail there, but in the end, retail is not ideal, right? Um, things, things that can reach millions of people are ideal. So it's a video that I made and just search it, you know, Richard Hart, one way to get rich. And, uh, and I think it still works today. I know it still works today because I, I tell people to yeah. do it. You know, I told a kid to, to do that and he started selling rings and jewelry on the internet and you know he bought a car and then uh you know th this stuff works right like business gets done there is money to be made in it <clears throat> so we said three things that changed my life start your own business mm -hmm. um yeah I, I i guess the tony robbins stuff has been useful right like reading and learning and then applying what you've learned i think that's great so i guess that would be uh you know, being a, being a learner and a, an experimenter that really will try new things just because you mm -hmm. read it and you never try it. It didn't help you. It's nothing. You, you got to try, try it. it. You got to use it. If you're not using it, it's just tragedy basically. Right. Um, and then what would the third thing be business? Well, learning. in the business you said first do a local business. Then after yeah. that's working, do the second business that scales. Well, yeah, I think that's a path anyone could take. Um, if you can just jump to the scaling thing first, congratulations, but it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder. Um, Absolutely. Because there's so, so few, there's so few businesses that really do scale. Um, and they tend to be highly competitive. Like, go try and make the next Uber. I dare you, right? Go try and make the next eBay. Very, very hard. Um, even Google can't make a, a next Facebook, right? Like, Google Plus just entirely failed. So the third thing... Third thing I did that was super important. Man, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it would be easy to say uh, like buy I mean, Bitcoin, but it didn't matter really. Like I've been rich for a long time. I would time. say like, Hex. <laughs> I think Hex right? could change the world. I think Hex could change the world. Um, it has the the ability to to get traction that that other things haven't had, right? Like Bitcoin doesn't have a referral program. Bitcoin doesn't have a uh, time locking and replace the CD. Bitcoin doesn't have cheaper fees. Bitcoin doesn't have higher throughput. Like Ethereum now with this new fork is doing ZK rollups and optimistic rollups, which can do 100 to 1,000 X trans uh, TPS on, on chain. Well, Hex benefits from all that, right? So like we have the opportunity to really get users. Right now, Bitcoin's only got 2.8 million wallets with over $1,000 in them. 42% of the entire currency is owned by addresses over 1,000, right? which if there's only 2,000 addresses over 1,000 and they own over 42% of the currency, that's fucking terrible. That is not good at all. People think that they're supporting something that's gonna change the world and get rid of banks and you're like, you know the banks own more than you do. So when you're, when you're pumping your bags and saying all these wonderful things about Bitcoin, you're making Tim Draper more money than you got. Now he's not a banker, he's a VC guy, but you get the idea. There's a social class of people that own more Bitcoin than you. The Plus Token Ponzi owns a percent of all Bitcoin. The Winklevoss twins own a percent of all Bitcoin. Satoshi owns 5% of all Bitcoin. Uh, Tim Draper, I think, might own a percent, right? Yeah. And then we go down this list and you're like, okay, actually, shit, um, the actual normal nice guys, the, the anarcho capitalists and whatnot, they don't actually own fuck all as, as far as percentage of Bitcoin goes. And you wanna, you wanna break this to them, like, hey guys, you know, uh, 
you're pumping the bags of this class of people that you don't actually like that much. You just don't realize it. Like who's who's really rich? The exchanges are rich. The Ponzi schemers are rich. Some early rich whale people that bought in heavy are rich. But the normal guy, he ain't that rich. To tell you the truth. <clears throat> well, I mean that's 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 deep. That's Hex solves this. We penalize and slash those guys. We make new whales. We're not socialists. We don't get rid of whales. We just make new ones. Get rid of the old ones, and we give you a chance I to mean, be a whale. 